Let's now turn to number 88. I sing the mighty power of God. Eighty-eight. Now stand for our opening song at the cross, number 163. How's everybody doing this morning? I'd like to welcome you to the Kansas City Central Church this morning. I see we have a 
few people, a few visitors here, and I want to express uh, a definite welcome for you, and, and I hope that you come back and worship with us again soon. Uh, in your bulletins for announcements this morning, uh, you can, I'm just going to leave it to you to uh, read the announcements. Um, I do want to uh, bring emphasis to a couple things. Um, the clothing bank, God's Closet, will be going this afternoon. And I ask that each person say a little prayer for that, all right, as individuals from the community come in and that they, they will receive a blessing. And if you have any extra clothing at home that you don't need or that you're thinking about getting rid of, summer clothes only. Yeah, don't, don't throw out your winter closets quite yet. Yeah, we, it's a storage issue, right, Marilyn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you have some clothing that you'd like to give away, um, you know, with God's closet, that's what, that's what is done there. And, and also for our pantry, you know, we also give out food and stuff uh, uh, to these individuals if they need it. And so just remember the church's pantry and whenever you can, buy an extra few canned goods. Yes, Malcolm? Okay, so I don't know if everybody heard that. Malcolm said he has 70 door hangers ready to go. So that means you go, you see him, he'll give you a bunch of them. You go hang these things on people's doors. It's got the steps to Christ in them, and it's got some other literature and stuff like that. And uh, I think I was told out there in the lobby that if people don't pick them up from it, then they're going to be forcing you to go out and do it. Right, Malcolm? Yeah. Well, let's don't put that burden on Malcolm. Let everybody pick, pick some up from him. All right. I want to um, also remind you that on the back of your bulletins there, this week's focus of prayer is Henry and Rena Dixon. Um, I do have a second reading here that we need to um, vote on, and it is for Aiden, Samuel, and Calcadin Alamihu. They are requesting a transfer membership from... This church here, Kansas City Central, to the Gladstone Church. So at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion. We've got a motion. Kathy has an announcement. You may have heard this week on one call that we did a harvest yesterday in the sharing garden. So today at the clothing closet, we will have fresh produce. We'll have mustard greens. We have lettuce. We have onions and radishes, um, arugula. So um, we're gonna have more than we need. So what I would suggest is that take one of Malcolm's door hangers, a loaf of bread and some of the produce and take it out to someone you know that's in need or that you would just like to reach out to. So after service, we'll have some of the produce out here on one of the tables. We're gonna reserve some of it for, of course, for the clothing closet, but. I think we're gonna have particularly lettuce. We have a lot more lettuce than what we need. So take a door hanger, a loaf of bread, and some lettuce and take it to someone. All right, thank you, Kathy. And you know, that's a very good idea that Kathy had right there. And you take them out with your door hangers. Don't just leave the hanger there, knock on the door, see if they're home and give them some produce also. And I will say this about the lettuce. Once it's harvested, it don't last long, so it needs to be used up. All right, where's Jerry Beth? Jerry Beth had an announcement she needs to bring to you guys also. There, there you go, Jerry. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm just up here as representative to my fellow mothers. I know that there are many of you that have worked hard for youth, children of your own and children not of your own. And the boys that are up here with me, gentlemen, will be handing out a small gift of thank you to you for your service. Thank you, ladies. Uttered his fateful pronouncement and warning on Jerusalem. The temple that Jesus looked down upon as he stood on Mount Olives was the second permanent structure to stand in that place. Originally, as the Israelites left Egypt, they had a temporary tent that traveled with them. And even after they got to Israel, it stood there in Shiloh and was used for 300 years. 
Eventually, the first temple was completed during the reign of King Solomon in 957 BC. This temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC, and many of the vessels were carried from Jerusalem over to Babylon. After the 70 years of captivity as prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah, the Israelites were allowed to return during the reign of the Medes and Persians under King Cyrus. This temple began to be rebuilt in 538 or 537 BC after the decree of Cyrus for the Jews to return to Jerusalem. Then they encountered some local opposition which caused some delays before it was completed in 515 BC. This temple stood for over 500 years and it was the one that Jesus visited, spoke in as a child, ministered as an adult and wept and cried over before he was crucified sometimes called Zerubbabel's temple because he was the one who started the reconstruction. It was later renovated and expanded on during the time of Herod. and cut the thing off and we'll go on with the service this morning. Uh, maybe we'll pick that up next Sabbath. Um, Kathy has agreed to do our uh, children's story this morning. So at this time, the children go ahead and come forward for the children's story. tell you a story. It's a true story, and many of you have heard this story, but you guys haven't heard this story. Do you guys know what it means to go backpacking? Yeah? Tell me what it means. Oh, okay. Well, backpacking means you carry everything on your back and go out in the woods, and you sleep out in the woods, and you cook your food out in the woods, and you take long hikes, and you go way, way out into the woods where nobody is, okay? And Ed and I like to do that, and we've done that many times. And one time we were out in Colorado. Now, when you go backpacking, you have to be prepared, okay? You have to make sure you have enough food, you have to know have enough shelter like we would take a tent with us and we'd have a sleeping pad to sleep on and a sleeping bag to keep us warm and we had a map which was one of the most important things we had with us was the map and so that led us on our way as we went into these trails because there wouldn't be signs to tell you take a left take a right you had to know where you were going so we were on this trip and we were on about our fourth day and we were going to the next day we were going to come back travel down the mountain we got up to the top of this what's called a saddle it's a break in the mountains where it's just kind of sloped like a horse saddle and we sat up there and we had lunch and then we said okay now we need to start down well we started down and we couldn't find the trail and we looked and we looked and we couldn't find the trail, so it's like, I said, well, you know, I'm looking at the map, and I said, I think if we just follow this ravine down, we'll be able to get back to our car, because that's straight, I know it's straight down there. Ed's like, no, no, we should go back. They always, the rule is, if you don't know where you are, backtrack. But we didn't have water behind us, and we were afraid we were going to run out of water. So we went 
as I had suggested, which was the wrong thing to do. And uh, we ended up in this ravine and we, at points it got so steep, we had to take off our backpacks and take a rope and rope them down and then climb down ourselves and then put our packs back down. Well, it got to be late afternoon, we were tired and we needed a place to rest for the night. But the ravine is like this. So there was really no place to put up a tent. But the Lord provided and he made this little shelf at the bottom of this slope and we put our tent up there and the next day we tried to um, figure out where we were. Didn't have any luck with the map and I also had a GPS with me and the GPS and, I, and the map were not coordinating. So long story short, three days later, we're still in this canyon. We have no food except for a, a little oatmeal and a few nuts and we're parsing that out between the two of us. We do have water because the ravine now has water in it. We're deep enough down that we could get water. So that was good. So I'm sitting there with the map and the GPS and we tried signal fires and everything else, but we were just too deep in this canyon. So I'm looking at the map, I'm looking at GPS and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And then I saw the mistake that we had made and I was able to pinpoint exactly where we were and then I was able to find us a route out of there. We had to bushwhack. In other words, we had to go through. We weren't on a trail anymore. We had to just bust through the woods to get up to the top of the mountain and back down the other side. But it took us within a quarter mile of our car eventually. So lesson learned there is a lesson that's also in our Bible, okay? You know, the problem we had is I did not know how to correctly read the map. I thought I did, but I really didn't, okay? And it's just like, this is our map. This is our map for life, you know? And if we don't know this map, we're going to be lost. There's a passage in Psalms 119, it's number 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Just like if I had known my map, we wouldn't have been lost. And if we know this, we will not be lost. Would anyone like to have prayer? Would you like to have prayer? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this Sabbath day. And thank you for always being a light for us and guiding us each day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Lord, we want to thank you so much for your Sabbath day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come apart from the world and to worship you. Lord, I pray that you please send your spirit to be with us this morning, to warm us and to comfort us as we worship you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
appeal I'm going to read this morning, Disaster and Famine Relief. Now, it says as we approach Christ's return, the Bible tells us that crisis events will increase around the world. Emergency management officials who have tracked disasters for over 50 years confirm that tornadoes are touching down with greater impact. Hurricanes are mounting at greater speeds and mass shootings continue to affect our communities on a regular basis. The Seventh-day Adventist Church serves those affected by these types of devastating events. Adventist Community Services responds throughout the North American Division. Volunteers open collection centers to support those whose homes have been destroyed. Support communities that have been struck by senseless shootings with emotional spiritual care teams and delivers supplies to areas of greatest need in the aftermath of a disaster. <clears throat> Your offering this Sabbath will ensure Adventist Community Services is able to prepare, respond, and work in recovery efforts that take place within the North American Division, which includes the United States, Canada, Bermuda, Guam, and Micronesia. While Adventist Community Services is responsible for these areas, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has not forgotten the rest of the world and has another humanitarian organization that responds to events outside of the North American Division called Adventist Development and Relief Association, also known as ADRA. <clears throat> Please give this Sabbath to the Disaster and Famine Relief Offering where your donation will support both Adventist Community Services and Adventist Development and Relief Association. We look forward to continuing our work to serve communities in Christ's name. Deacons, would you be, please stand? Heavenly Father, as uh, these uh, disasters increase, according to Bible prophecy, we need to be uh, aware of these things and to help where help is needed. And so as these offerings are taken and our tithes today, we ask for your blessing on them that they may be uh, increased and take care of the needs that uh, have, the world has. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we do our intercessory prayer this morning, I want to give you one more announcement. It slipped my mind a little bit ago while I was giving the announcements. I guess that's what happens when you get a little older. And so my memory slips. <laughs> I have a wonderful announcement to share with the church is that we now have a new pastor. And, uh, and we had the meeting this last week at Independence Church. And uh, his, na his name is Anthony 
and his wife's name, I think is Lucy, or I mean Lisa is what I remember, and then Jerry Beth told me a little bit ago, says, no, it's Lucy. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, there again, it could be just my mind doing that to me again. So anyway, they have three children, all right, and, and so that'll be nice to be able to get a little infusion of some youth coming into this church, and uh, we really look forward to them coming, and it's, that certainly is an answer of prayer for us. Um, he comes from, uh, he was last pastor at the Poplar Bluff and the Donovan churches, and so, and I think Mark, then they said it was going to be around 1st of July or something like that before he'd be able to be here. So as they make this transition in this move, keep them, keep our new pastor and his family in prayer, okay? All right, so now it's time for our intercessional prayer. So as far as possible, shall we kneel for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we come to you to raise our petitions to you. Lord, we have a number of people in our congregation who are ailing. And Lord, we ask that you please lay your healing hands upon them, Lord. And as I, I think about Malcolm and Peggy, I think about Laura, Maurice, and Lord, I know that there are other individuals who have ailments here that that I just don't know about. And so, but Lord, I pray that you please lay your healing hands upon them also. Lord, I also know that there are those who may be discouraged. And I pray that you give them comfort. I also know that there are some here who are looking for employment. And so, Lord, I just pray that you please open the doors for them, if it be thy will, Lord. Lord, we see all the evil that's going on in the world today, all the strife, all the trouble, all the suffering that so many are having to go through. Lord, we pray that your coming will be soon, that you'll put an end to all of this, and that we can go and be at home with you. Lord, we want to also raise up our praises and our gratitude to you. You have answered our prayers, and, and we will be getting another pastor and we thank you so much for that, Lord. And I pray that his transition from where he's at now to, to coming to this church, that it will go smoothly for them. Lord, I also pray that you please be with our speaker, Darren. Please touch his lips. Send your spirit to speak through him and open every heart and mind, Lord, to receive the message that you have for each one of us. And Lord, we do want to thank you for all your many blessings. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. His name's Anthony Rudolph, and he'll be here around the first week of July. Good morning, everyone. Please turn in your Holy Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and that is verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Thank you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning. Good morning. S Sabbath blessings to everybody. Uh, before I get started, if you pull out your bulletin and you open up under the announcements, third line there, the third announcements, you will find our prayer line. Monday through Friday at 6.30 p.m., we have a prayer line, and uh, we need more people to pray, just plain and simple. I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but... Uh, how many of you have an unsaved loved one, like a spouse or kids or somebody that you really want to witness to and you really want to see in heaven? We've got a number of people around here who are extremely ill, 
And uh, how are these things going to happen? By us just hoping that it happens? Well, I don't think so, but by prayer, by prayer, by prayer. Now, over the last couple of years, we've probably averaged maybe five people, six people praying, and we could, we could sure use a whole lot more people. And you don't even have to pray out loud. You just have to give your request. You can pray quietly, pray silently, and just join us. We prayed a lot for Vacation Bible School, and Jerry had 17 kids last year. We've been praying for the new pastor, praying for the pianist. We've got it. Been praying for more kids, and uh, last week we had, had a whole lot of kids. God is here in prayer. And the more people who pray, the more that God can work. So I really encourage you and ask you, please, call in at least one night a week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of talking to you in prayer. And we're grateful for all the prayers that you've answered. Lord, I pray that you'll speak through me and give the congregation the, the ears to hear what you want them to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 and verse 16. And we will be in Acts. And then also in your bulletin is some extra Bible verses that, that you will need as we go along. Acts 16, verse 16. And the title of this sermon is Tough Times. Tough Times. Acts 16, we're going to start with verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, you might know that Luke, he wrote the book of Acts, and Luke, Paul, Silas, and Timothy... They're ministering in the city of Philippi. And Satan here sends a demon-possessed girl to follow after them and harass them. And she's saying, these guys will tell us how to be saved. These guys tell us all about eternal life. Now, we don't know the tone of her voice, if she's being sarcastic or she's being very serious. All we know is it says that she followed them for many days doing this. Now, she's demon-possessed, and she's essentially a fortune teller. The people all know you can go to her, pay the masters a certain amount of money, and she will tell your fortune for you. And she must have had a measure of success, otherwise people would not have been going to her. Now, some people think that, well, only God can tell the future, which, of course, that's true. So if somebody can tell the future, they must be from God. But let's not forget, the devil's a pretty good guesser. And not only that, he can predict the future and then go try to make it happen. So just because somebody, even in the church, successfully predicts the future, doesn't necessarily mean that it's from God. In verse 18, it says, for many days she does this. So for many days she's given approval to their message. And it could be that she's trying to link her demonism with the preaching of the gospel. You know, it's okay, yes, accept Jesus as Savior and continue with witchcraft, continue with magic. And the people that time would have loved that. Yes, let's give our heart to Jesus and let's keep into casting spells and witchcraft. And she's harassing them, harassing them, and Paul finally, he's had enough, and he says, all right, get out of her demon and cast the demon out. Now, you think everybody would be glad. You think everybody would be rejoicing. This poor demon-possessed girl has been set free, but not everybody's happy. Verse 19 to 21. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, 
neither to observe being Romans. The owners are mad. They're absolutely mad. They see that all hope of their money making is gone. They must have made thousands, tens of thousands of dollars off of her. So they grab Paul and Silas, drag them to the magistrates, bring trumped up charges against them. And how do the rulers, how do the magistrates respond? Well, we better thoroughly investigate this. We better do our job properly and let's find out what is right, what is wrong. Well, that's not what happened. In verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes, many stripes upon them, they cast him into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stalks. There's a large crowd gathered together, and they, of course, knew the girl, knew the owners, and they all seem to be supporting the girl and the owners. And the magistrates see that, and instead of launching an investigation, they just immediately grab Paul and Silas and begin to have them whipped and beaten. It says here, many stripes, many stripes. Then they drag them to the jailer, and the jailer takes them, throws them into the dungeon, puts their feet in stocks, that, that kind of arches the back, so you're in a terrible, painful situation. Plus, their backs were just, just beaten bloody. Tremendous pain. Complete injustice. Complete unfairness should not have happened. I remember several years ago at work, uh, I was working towards a promotion, and I made a mistake. I did. It was a little mistake, not that big of a deal. My boss calls me into the office, starts talking to me about it. And yeah, I made a mistake there. And then he starts talking about something else. Well, yeah, I know, but I, I didn't do that. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm holding you responsible for it. Well, I had nothing to do with it. Well, it didn't matter. He was going to hold me responsible for it. Nevertheless, I wasn't up for promotion anymore. At least he didn't take and have me beaten, though it seemed like he wanted to. Injustice occurs. Things that aren't right, things that aren't fair... In a world of sin, in a world where there's devils everywhere, things that aren't right, things that aren't fair, are going to happen. They're going to happen. The Apostle Paul had some really bad times, some really tough times. 2 Corinthians 11, we read about it. It's on your sheet there. Paul says, In labors, more abundant. In stripes, more above measure, that is being beaten. In prison, more frequent. In deaths, oft, you know, facing death. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So on five different occasions, they beat him 39 times on his back. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice suffered I shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in other words, running for his life, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, just so tired because he's having to run, so much pain because he's suffering for the gospel's sake. In watchings or sleepless nights often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul had some tough times. Paul had some really tough times. Paul had some really tough times that he faced for the gospel's sake. Things that he didn't deserve. Things that were so unfair. Things that should not have happened. But they did. Are we going to have tough times? Are we going to have bad times? Are we going to suffer things that this isn't right, this shouldn't have happened, this is so unfair, there's nothing I can do about it. I think it's going to happen. We're unemployed, and, and we can't find a job. We just can't find a job. Done all we can to take care of our health, and something happens. Getting in an accident, and our health is just gone. Maybe the government, believe it or not, just isn't doing what they should do. 
In the world of sin, injustice occurs. In the world where the devil hates us, bad things happen. Bad things happen. And sometimes it looks so innocent. I just happened to get in a car wreck. Now, they had layoffs at work. The whole department got fired. I just happened to have a bad reaction to some meds. Sometimes it looks so innocent. Sometimes it looks like it couldn't have been avoided. But a lot of times, if we could look behind the scenes, we would see the devil working. You know, the devil would get the whole department laid off just to get you. The devil would bring a tornado just to knock your house out. The devil would do whatever it takes just to get us because he hates us. He's working against us. He's doing all he can to take us out. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Wherein in time past he walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, now get this, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, the devil is working in people. Everybody who's not given their heart to Jesus Christ, the devil is working in them. If you haven't made a faith commitment, if you haven't surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, the devil's working in you, whispering in your ear, giving you thoughts, giving you suggestions. And by the way, in case you don't know, he's got billions of demons to help him out, so it's not just him. But some people, he plays like a fiddle, just tells them exactly what to do, and they go do it. Other people, not quite so much, but still, he's whispering in the ear, trying to get us to do things that he wants us to do. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I know it looks like people are the problem, but people aren't the problem. It's the devil behind the people. The devil working behind the people, coming after us, trying to get us, trying to make life hard for us. And the verse here says, we deal against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Sounds like we're dealing with the strongest of the demons. The devil sends his demons, the strongest ones, against the born-again Christians. No wonder life gets so hard sometimes. No wonder life gets so difficult sometimes. We wonder, why does life have to be so bad? Well, sometimes it should be a whole lot worse than it is. It's only by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, by the help of God that life isn't worse. In 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Satan's working. Satan is absolutely working. And we can't think it's strange when we face fiery trials, when life gets really hard, when life gets really tough. The devil hates us. I probably don't have to tell you that. The devil absolutely hates us, and he comes after us with fiery trials, attacks, doing all he can to make life as hard for us as possible. But we're told here, verse 13, rejoice, rejoice. God is with us. Rejoice. Jesus will see us through. Rejoice. He's there to help us. He loves us. He cares about us. He's with his children. In 2 Timothy 2, 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier, Jesus Christ. It's going to be hard sometimes. It is. It's going to be really hard sometimes. But through the, the grace of Christ, we can make it. Through the strength of Christ, we can endure. As we tap into his help and his strength, we can make it. We can stand. Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Strengthened as we tap into his power. As we read the Bible every day, we can tap into the power of Christ. As we take time to pray every day, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can give us the strength we need. As the devil hits us, as the devil comes after us, and he is, and he's plotting against us right now, 
we tap into God's power, he sees us through. It's the only way to get through as a born-again Christian. Not our strength, his strength. Not my power, tapping into his power, his help, his strength. Now the devil, he's got all kinds of plots, all kinds of schemes against us. A few years ago, we had a, a big layoff at my work. When the dust settled, they laid off one-third of the American staff. And I, I was what they called a delayed layoff. I got to keep my job for four months, and then they let me go. But I was thankful for four more months. Right after everything was announced, a couple days later, I was talking to my boss about it, and he said, Darren, I didn't want to let you go because you're the only one who knows all the products. But when it, right as they were about to announce the layoffs, the, the big guy said, well, I'm going to let the vice president decide who gets laid off. So they brought the vice president in, and he didn't know anybody. He was just picking names out of a hat, and I got laid off. If it wasn't for that, I, I wouldn't have been laid off. The devil works. You know, the devil's working. He's plotting against us. He's scheming against us. We're going to have tough times. The Bible says so. Now, the devil has several ways to attack us. The first is temptation. Think about a warrior back in those days. And he goes into battle. He's got a you know, nice big shield. Big shield, and he's hiding behind it. The arrows come after him and the swords. And well, he's hiding behind the shield. The only way they're going to get him is if he foolishly drops the shield and you know, comes out, and here I am, go ahead and hit me. Well, we're hiding behind Christ. Christ protects us, at least in a measure, against the attacks of the devil. And we are hiding behind him. But the devil knows if he can get us to embrace temptation, it's just like we're dropping the shield, and then he can hit us full force. Some of us are getting hit, and we're wondering why. Maybe it's because we're giving in to temptation. Maybe the devil brings temptation against us, and we give in to sin, and then... We're casting the shield of Christ aside. Devil comes right after us and he hits us. The next thing he tries to do is uh, annoy us. Something's happened. He's just trying to annoy us. Um, Jerry and I, we own a four-wheel drive truck. Well, I should say she does. She doesn't let me drive very often. But I, I, I've read this. In a four-wheel drive truck, the tread on your tires has to all be the same. If you have a tire blowout and you got to get a new one, so the, the tread's really not the same, it can actually destabilize your drive. You can have some problems. Well, we had a tire blowout, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to buy four new tires, so we went and bought a used tire. Pulled into the place, got the used tire. We're pulling out, and we ran over something. And we're driving down the highway. You can hear the click, click. And then we didn't hear it anymore because it fell off and we're stuck on the side of the road with a flat tire. So I get out there to change it and in our truck we've got this long system and the system's broke and I can't change the tire. Got to call a tow truck. Devil just tries to annoy us. He does all kinds of things, whatever he can, just to get us complaining, just to get us murmuring, hopefully against God, he says, just trying to annoy us. Devil tries to discourage us. You know, nobody likes you. Nobody cares about you. God's not going to answer your prayers. He just tries to discourage us, does whatever he can to discourage us. Next, persecute. We don't see a lot of that in America, but don't worry, we will in the days ahead. And sometimes the devil sends people against us just to target us or target our business. Persecution. Persecution works, and in the days ahead, we'll see a whole lot more of that. Devil's working. And another way is pain. You're suffering because you're a Christian. You know, if you would just compromise, you wouldn't be suffering. If you would just give up your faith, you wouldn't be suffering. Devil works all kinds of ways. He's got all kinds of schemes against us. Tough times. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thy own understanding. Trust in God. No matter what happens, trust in God. No matter how bad it gets, trust in God. No matter when we think, well, it should be like this, and it doesn't turn out like that, trust in God. Commit your way to Him, pray much, read your Bible much, and trust in God. When it's really hard, pray much and trust in God. 
Don't run from God, run to God. When you face the tough times, when life gets really, really bad, don't run from God, run to God. You absolutely need him. I absolutely need him. Now, the devil, in case you didn't know, he hates us. You know, he hates you. Some of his attacks, they, they kind of look like blessings. You know, here's some money. Here's some extra money. What a great blessing. Now go chasing after money. You did a great job. You're fantastic. Tries to get us all prideful. You deserve to indulge. Tries to get us all selfish. Devil knows what he's doing. He's so subtle. He's so deceptive. We need Christ. We need Christ every day. We need to reconnect with Jesus every day. We need to be into the Word and into prayer every day. It's our only hope. It's our only help. It's the only way we're going to make it. Some of his attacks are intense. They're absolutely intense. He might cause a car wreck. I remember, oh, six or seven years ago, I was on my way to work, before the layoffs, of course, and uh, I was driving through Raytown. It was early in the morning, so it's still dark out. And there's an area on 350 Highway where it goes from 45 to 55. So I was going 55, and this car tries to cross the road in front of me, and he didn't make it. And I just smashed into the, into the guy going 55 miles an hour, totaled out both cars. The devil knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He's very subtle. He might raise up mean neighbors against us. Oh, 15, 18 years ago, Jerry and I were living in Peculiar, Missouri, and uh, we had some neighbors down the street. They were actually pr very nice people, but their dog wasn't very nice. And they let their dog just run free. Dog starts coming in our yard, growling at the kids, showing the teeth at the kids. And, you know, you, you, you can't have that. We had to go talk to them. Devil does all kinds of things against us, raising up all kinds of things against us. Might target the business by go out of his way just to get us sick. We need God. We need God's help. We need God's strength. During tough times, we have to run to God even more. Don't run from God. Run to God. We absolutely need him. 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're told it's coming. We're told it's going to happen. We can't be shocked when these things happen to us. Tough times are going to come. We've probably all suffered tough times. And we need God. We need his help. We need his strength. Especially in the days ahead. They're going to twist what we say. See, they're a bunch of legalists. They're going to quote us out of context. See, they're nothing but a cult. People are going to be denouncing us. Unfair things, unjust things, things that we can't do anything about, they're going to happen. In Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Devil's going to turn everyone against us. Devil's going to turn the whole nation against us. It's going to be unfair. It's not going to be right. It's going to be completely unjust, and there's not a thing we can do about it. We take it to God in prayer. We take it to God in prayer again, and we be faithful to him, and we be committed to him over and over and over. Matthew 10, 21 and 22. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Those who endure are going to make it. Those who stand through the tough times are going to make it. Those who stand through the power of Christ, through the strength of Christ, they will make it. They will have eternal life. Jesus will be there with us every step of the way. We don't run from God during tough times. We run to God. We need his help even more. We need his strength even more. Some of the things that are happening to us right now, God is allowing them to prepare us for the days ahead. He wants us to stand. He does. He wants us to be ready. He does. And he allows things to happen in mercy, in love. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. 
but he's there to help us. He's there to strengthen us. He's trying to get us ready because he wants us to stand. Acts 16, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So how'd they handle the attack? As they're in jail, their feet are in stocks, their backs are just hamburger, or veggie burger if you prefer, and they're just in so much pain, they begin to sing. Sing and praise and worship God. The other prisoners heard them and thought, man, these guys have flipped their lid. What's wrong? They're crazy. I can't say I always sing during trials, but uh, not a bad way to handle it. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing. That is, don't be, don't be full of care. Don't be full of anxiety and, and worry and, and all eaten up with stress. But in everything. Everything you face, every trial you go through, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, supplication means I'm continuing to take this to God in prayer. I don't just pray once, I keep taking it to Him. You know, the trials here today, pray about it today. Trials here this afternoon, pray about it this afternoon. Trials here tomorrow, pray about it tomorrow. Now, keep taking it, keep taking it to God in prayer. He says, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your strength. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When tough times come, we are given the privilege of taking them to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father loves it when we trust Him enough to take it to Him in prayer. And He will hear, and He will help, and He will strengthen He's working to get us through it. Some people get mad at God, though, during the trials. Some people blame God during the trials. I remember talking to my mom several years ago, and she was telling me, Darren, see, my friend blames all of her problems on God. We need to run to God when there's trouble. Run to Him for help. Run to Him for strength. He's the one that will see us through. He's the one that will get us through. We can't blame God. We need his help. We need his strength. He's there for us. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He says to ask. Ask. Ask for help. Ask for strength. Ask for endurance. Ask God, help me to get through this. Some people get so mad at God, and they weren't even asking. God, why did you allow this to happen? They weren't even asking for help. God, why did this thing go on? And they weren't even asking for help. We have to ask. God can't answer prayers that we don't pray. God can't help us through when we're not asking for his help. He says, ask. Then he says, seek and knock. Well, that's something I have to do. So as I ask... I may have to do more than just ask. I may have to seek and knock. I may have to go take care of my health. Okay, what do I need to do to take care of my health? I may have to go hand out a lot more resumes. What do I got to do to get a job? I may have to go ask my friends, pray for me, and ask for advice. We ask, we seek, we knock. God has answers. God has answers. He wants to help his children through. Don't run from God when trouble comes. Run to God. He's the one there to help us. He's the one there to strengthen us. 1 John 3, 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There are conditions to answered prayer. Some people get so upset, God won't answer my prayers. God won't hear my prayers. Well, are we keeping the conditions? Are we keeping his commandments? Are we doing things that are pleasing in his sight? There are conditions to every promise and every prayer that we make. We have to do our part. God does not say he'll do his part if uh, we just go out and live any way we want. If we want his help, we need to pray. We need to ask. We need to live the way that we know we should live. He'll help us. He will help us. Now, 
Paul and Silas, did they feel the urge to strike back? I mean, not that they could, of course, but were they up there just gritting their teeth? Man, just let me at these guys. Jesus, just take these guys out. Well, I'm not so sure they were. Remember Moses? Remember Moses as they were uh, yelling at Moses, threatening to stone Moses? Let's just take Moses out. Yet we read in Exodus 32, 32, Moses says, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. As they were doing all these terrible things to Moses, he was praying for them, interceding for them. Save their souls, Lord. I don't think he was saying, get them, Lord, take these guys out. You might remember Stephen. As they're stoning him, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Jesus, in Luke 23, 34, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't think Paul and Silas were cursing them in their heart. I don't think Paul and Silas were saying, God, get them. God, just take these guys out. Matthew 5, 44. Jesus says, this is how we should respond. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus says this is how we respond to the attacks. He says to love them. Now only God can help us do that. I, I, I honestly, I can't love people who are attacking me. I just can't. But through the power of Christ, we can. Through his help and strength, we can. He says bless them. Don't be mean back. Don't be yelling back. Don't be fighting back. He says do good to them. Take them a loaf of bread, as, as Kathy said earlier. But bring them some of, the, some of the produce out of the garden. No, letting the air out of their tires is not doing good to them. Throwing eggs at their car is not doing good to them. He says, pray for them. It's obvious they need it. Pray for them. It's hard to hate people that you're praying for. It's hard to want to attack people that you're praying for. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Proverbs 20, 22. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. He says, don't fight back. Don't strike back. Don't be mean back. Any heathen can do that. Yep. Any unbeliever can do that. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be committed Christians who live the way God calls us to live. I know it's hard sometimes. It's not always easy. But through his help, through his strength, he'll see us through. Acts 16, 30 to 33. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. God caused an earthquake to occur, and it opened up all the jail doors and, and caused all the manacles to fall off of their hands, all the chains to fall off, and the prisoners all could have gotten away. But they didn't, they stayed put. The jailer comes in, he sees this, he thinks he's in real trouble, but Paul cries out, no, we're all here, D don't worry about it. The guy then comes in, kneels down, and says, what must I do to be saved? He then takes Paul and Silas home and cleans them up and feeds them. And Paul and Silas preach to him and his whole household, and they're all baptized that day. Now, some people misunderstand this story. They think, well, that's an example. We can preach to somebody for two hours, and then we can baptize them. Well, I don't think that's what they're trying to point out here. Because how did the jailer know to come to him and say, what must I do to be saved? He must have heard them previously preaching in the city, so he already had a pretty good idea what they were preaching. Paul then just took him and the family, kind of filled in the gaps, and then they were baptized. As a result of all this, a whole family was saved. And in Romans 8, 28, and we know that, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. 
God promises in everything we face, he'll bring something good out of it. In every trial we go through, in every tribulation, in every struggle, he will bring something good out of it. And I can't guarantee a whole family is going to be saved, but he says he will bring something good out of it. Now, there's two conditions in this verse, Romans 8, 28. First of all, we love God. We've got to really love God with all the heart. And then those who are called according to his purpose. Not my purpose, not what I want in life, but what does God want in, in life? And when that's the case, he promises he will bring something good out of it. Everything you face, every bad time you go through, every trouble and every struggle you face, he says, I'll bring something good out of it. When the trouble comes, we don't run from God, we run to God for help and strength. Okay, I got three verses here I want to close with. Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison at, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, I will give thee the crown of life. He says, be faithful unto death. You've got the crown of life waiting for you. Be committed to God no matter what you go through. The crown of life is waiting for you. Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not, there, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. God says, don't give up your faith. Whatever you do, don't give up your faith. Whatever you do, don't give up your trust in me. Whatever you do, keep coming to me day after day for help and strength because I'm there and I will see you through. And then finally here, Psalms 37, 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way. He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. We gotta wait on the Lord. He doesn't always answer on my time. We got to wait on the Lord. He doesn't always come the second I want him to, but he's there. He'll help us. He'll see us through. As, as, we, uh, as, we have our closing, as we have our closing song, you know, if the Lord's touched anybody's heart, you realize you need more prayer, you need to recommit yourself to the Lord, please come down front. Whoever comes down front, we'll all pray for you. Our closing song, let's stand for it. It'll be number 75. The wonder of it all.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you'll help us through tough, through tough times. And Lord, as the devil attacks, I pray for each and every one of us, help us run to you and not run from you. In Jesus' name, amen. And bread and door hangers out on the table.